morning. Oh, 
to live a life in Christ, to renew our faith. Question that I want to ask you as we go through worship today is what is God doing for you to remind you of goodness and grace to share with all who you need? What is God doing to transform your life? Welcome to worship. Uh, we have some announcements this morning that I do want to share with you. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts this evening. So it's right in the Yeah, Bob Barger and say, I want this 
students, okay? Um, don't hurt her. Uh, just go get them back there. Uh, Christmas and summertime. Also, um, Emmy Church wanted me to announce that July 10th and 11th, Community Blood Center will be hosting a uh, blood drive. Instead of it being at the First Baptist Church this year, this time, July 10th and 11th, it is going to be at Maryville High School. And so that's a change of location. If you're used to giving blood at the First Baptist Church, July 10th and 11th, the blood drive will be at Maryville High School. And so I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that. I told John last night I was going to say something about the few announcements we had. That seemed like a lot of announcements, but there's a lot going on in the life of our church. Next Sunday, you'll be able to come up to communion and receive a card to pray over one of those of us that are going on a mission trip. And prior to that, in the prayer time, um, Christine uh, Vincent is going to consecrate and pray to join us with a gift of a blessing uh, before we load up July 5th to go on that trip. And so, look forward to seeing you all next Sunday as we embark on this beautiful mission trip. All hearts are here and ready to worship. We're ready to sing God's praises. We invite the acolytes to come forward. And as we hear this, my prayer and my hope for each one of us today that we find something in this time of worship that delights God and delights our spirits. That we mingle with God's Spirit throughout the rest of this week. Will you stand as the light comes in?
the audience of one, I love that thought, the audience of one that was spoken in our prayer in the chapel this morning, uh, and the expression of that uh, knows that we are not here merely for fellowship, but we are here to do fellowship with the Holy One God who invites us as the church to be the church, to love the church, and to let the church live. We are alive in Christ. We come to our prayer time this morning, recognizing that there's a lot going on in our church family. We lift up prayers and praises to Shirley for the work that she and her team have done for Vacation Bible School. And we pray for each child's heart to be renewed and to come to know Savior Jesus. I love Vacation Bible School because it renews my heart. The songs we sing encourage us to continue to teach Jesus to those we meet. Readying our hearts for mission trip, I ask that you, church, be in prayer for the 29 of us that are going on mission, that we go the way that we are and we come back changed. That God does something mighty in us as we have expectation to do great things in Andover, Minneapolis. That we come back renewed, refreshed, transformed. Will you place that on your heart, beginning now, for this team to go? It's been since 2019 since we've had an adult mission for friends, and here we are. Pray for us that we make a difference in this world. That's where God has called us. And as we have those on our hearts today, we know that there are many other things we have on our hearts. So we lift that to God in prayer, and as we come to our reflection time, you are encouraged to come forward and hear the altar, light a candle, to spend time with God wherever you are in this sanctuary. For the glory of God is right here. God has been waiting for us, just this group, the right people right here, to show up and be here. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, people of God, for coming today. As we take our time for a moment of prayer, will you bow your hearts with me, please? Holy God, precious one, creator of all things, goodness and life, we adore you, the audience of one. We come into this place today to honor you, to glory you, and to sing praises to your name for the gift we have of eternal life in your one and only Son, Jesus, who is our Christ, Messiah, Savior, friend of sinners. You are God, and you are holy, and you are worthy of all of our praise. And so we come today with hearts ready to worship you. As we find ourselves on the path of discipleship, may we find ourselves more aware and more intentional along the journey to see with Christ-like eyes through our Christ-like heart. We want to be more like Jesus, the one who saves us from our sin, renews us, sets us right, and makes us alive. Willing to live every moment to your glory, God, to your glory and your goodness. So we praise you and we seek you and we say this as if we truly believe it, not empty words, but true praise to the one who offers truth and the one who is truth eternal. This morning, as we ready our spirits for worship, we ask for healing of our wayward hearts and heart that takes us into an unswerving path. We are grateful to be on this journey, grateful to be together with one another on this journey because of you and all that you are doing through us. So we are your church. We're together each day, your people who have been placed to do your good works and to feel your love and to share that love with all who we need. We're on this left path together for encouragement and for relationship and for comfort and for peace. 
peace. May we be one together in your name and in your love and grace. For you make us alive to live fully for you. Lord, we pray today for those that are not here with us. We pray for those that are finding a time of struggle and worry and concern. Those that might be seeing healing. Um, those that are waiting for seizures to come. Those who are waiting for answers. And those that are receiving a new diagnosis. And those with the good news in the midst of health crisis, we pray for your healing hand to be upon them, anoint them with good health. For that brings hope into their lives, Lord, we pray. We pray for those who are missing loved ones. We pray for families in the time of loss, those lives lost at sea this past week. Great deliverer, bring your healing and your hope into our world. For you are the deliverer. You are the gift of hope and eternal life. As we pray, Lord, we pray for your continued presence among us. We pray for your wisdom and we pray for your grace and we pray for your peace. And as we pray, Lord, the unmentioned of our hearts, may you feel what you already know come from us. As we individually give you those needs in this time, you, God, you lift the burdens. You lift the burdens in such a way that we walk in that pathway of hope and we are refreshed because you are lifting those burdens right now. We praise you because you are so able. We seek your wisdom. We seek your grace. We seek your peace as we seek after the likeness of Jesus. Who is the one that went to the cross and died for us that we might receive forgiveness? Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that we have. That we might turn from our old ways and into the new and to live alive in you. Thank you. As we come together as your body this morning, we come together and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. We know today we are on the pathway of discipleship. We pray together our Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you so much, Eleanor. Our scripture today is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that thy grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For, at, for we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might not be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. The word of God for the people of God. So 
experience. And I went and I put on a robe. And they opened up the curtains. Some of you have been to those churches where they have the big curtains behind the pulpit, right? They reveal the pool that's full of water. And I remember looking out into the congregation and taking those steps down. And I remember being held so gently and dumped into the water. And I want to tell you something. It seemed like forever before I came up. But I felt okay. I felt like there was something dramatic yet mysterious happening under that water that when I came up, there was something new about me. Did I do everything right from that point forward? Or you call my mom, she'll tell you. Right? Transformation is something that happens to us when we say yes to Jesus Christ, when we say, yes, Lord, I hear your voice. Yes, Lord, I want to follow you. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to stick my foot on the pathway of discipleship. At 15 years old, unchurched pretty much until that time, I had no idea the work that God had already done in me and the work that he was doing at that very time that would bring me to my future expression of my love for God. I don't know about you, if you have some kind of baptism story, most of us as United Methodists, we were baptized as an infant. But maybe your confirmation story is that moment when you said, yes, Transformation. I know that I have died with Christ. The waters of baptism down in the deep darkness of the water, the symbolism of drowning away the old and rising up to what is new. I believe that is what the scripture is reminding us of today. Paul is really, really, really good at asking rhetorical questions. And I envision Paul writing this and pausing and maybe giving notes of those that would receive this letter. At this point, it's the Christians in Rome, not to any one church, but the scattered Christians in Rome. That one person would go and deliver this letter and read it out loud to a group of Christians and then this letter would go from person to person who would be the spokesperson of Paul and I can imagine Paul asking these questions throughout Romans that seem rhetorical and of course our questions are always answered by Paul are you crazy? Of course not, right? This very first question what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And that's where the note that Paul might have written a note out the side. Say this with emphasis and talks. I think that's how we should read it, right? Kathy this morning during the call to worship was very astute to recognize exclamation points in the call to worship. That should change the way that we read things, the way that we see things, and the way that we perceive the text. Abundantly, the answer to this question is, of course not, by no means, but it is a question that Paul asks because there were a group of people that were running around thinking God's grace is so amazing and so powerful and so warming and so lovely. It doesn't really matter what I do in my life. I'm going to run off and do this for a while and come back and go, forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. As the church was developing in these early days, they were trying to correct and redirect what this newness of life was all about. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Heavens, no! Grace is that power point that transforms us and helps us to recognize that what we once were before 
relationship. We are on the pathway. We are on the journey of life. All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. But it also means we were baptized into his death. That the waters of baptism, whether we were dumped and held out for a while, but it felt like I needed it, poured upon, sprinkled, maybe you were taken out to a creek and walked into the natural waters. In a form of baptism, it is the symbolism of the grace of God that goes before us, that changes us and transforms us. That we are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, that order, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too may live a new life. So my question for us today, friends, how do we live a life in Christ? Last week, we talked about the way of the call of discipleship. Today, we further that pathway of discipleship all along the journey, asking ourselves, how do we live a life in Christ? Wondering what it's going to take for us to grow more spiritually to meet the divine nature of Jesus Christ and let that transformation take place. The pervening and grace of God as Wesleyans, we understand perveniently God started working on us long before we knew that we even needed God. To that point, we ourselves find that we need to be made right. And righteous in Christ, made just. And so we are justified through the baptism and sanctified to live out this new life. Because we have been united with Christ in death. We are united with Christ, with Jesus in resurrection. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, as United Methodists, we get blamed a lot for not talking about sin enough, right? I don't want to step on your toes. I want to make us understand that what might be sin in my life might not be sin in your life. I gave the example of that the other day to Karina when we were talking about what is sin, what does it look like, and my understanding of sin is that thing in our life, and maybe it's multiple things, those things in our life that separate us from having a full relationship with God. Now that might look different for each and every one of us here, but I also want to remind us that sin is not only an individual thing, it is a corporate thing, and there are some things that we do as a body that causes us to sin and separate us from God. I think the church has struggled with that for decades, for generations. And maybe we're in a place of the change of the transformation of who we are as United Methodists to visit that and what it takes, what it looks like. But we know that systemic sin is deep embedded in our nature as human beings. And I think that's why we need Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus to continue to transform us. We need Jesus in our lives to transform us in a way that we begin to meet with other people and seek to transform one another together in this discipleship pathway. That as we disciple one another, that one another begins to grow and the community of faith expresses what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ on the pathway of new life and transformation. That we might truly be alive in Christ. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of dead Christians. I see a lot of people that feel that they have reached 
the maximum point of their baby's life, and they're going to just ride it up, right? And I want to challenge us today as the church, as the body of Christ, as individuals and faith who come together to ignite our faith in Jesus Christ as one, what it might look like to embolden one another along the path, along the journey. What does it look like for us to truly be the church? Why did Jesus call the disciples together as he ascended into heaven and say, Go and make disciples. Go and teach all that I have taught. Go and be and do. And do this in a powerful and intentional way. Because this is new life. The expression of that new life that brings freedom in Jesus Christ. That we are no longer slaves to sin. We turn away from it. So the question for us and the weight of the call to the path of the disciple that is desiring to grow within us as the church, how do we live a life in Christ? I think that we need to be more intentional. I think that we need to do that in a way that we are truly practicing our faith. We have tons of small groups around here that have room for other people to come and be a part of those small groups. We have a need for a men's group to restart, to come together, to disciple one another, to encourage one another. That we might be intentional in that. Along with that, we need to be bold, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity and fear, but he gave us the power of love to live it out together. And we need to be risk takers. We need to let the path of discipleship lead us into something new. And what does that new look like for you individually? What does it look like for us as the church? That we might let the grace of God allow us to gather as one, to be alive in our faith journey together intentionally, on the journey, intentionally, on the journey to live out our baptismal vows, serving boldly and taking risks through our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our witness and our service, right? Every single one of us that have become a member of this church, we recognize those vows that we took, that we fold into from our baptism to our membership to the work that we do together as the body of Christ. Your prayers, intentionally praying big every single day for God to show you the path. Intentionally seeking the presence of God and intentionally showing up right here and out there for others. Intentionally witnessing your faith to everyone that you meet in ways that God is showing you, opening the door for the words to be spoken to say, God loves me and this is how I know it. Intentionally seeking out what those words might look like and intentionally serving with risk because intentionality is the invitation to spiritual growth. Some of you, friends, you have been intentionally raising your hand saying, send to me, I want to go and I want to preach at Parnell and Elmo. Thank you for offering that gift. Some of you have said yes to help with Vacation Bible School to transform the hearts of young people in our church. Thank you for those of you that say yes. Some of you are in the process of getting a student's name to buy back to school clothing. That is a mission experience that transforms not only ourselves, but the child and the student that we will never meet who receives hope from the work that we do. Thank you, church, for that. Some of you 
you have them both say, yes, I'm ready, let's go on a mission trip. And what I love about mission trips, friends, is the bonding of those that are going and it's an experience that we come back different and new. Because what we find out is we go to aid and help and build and rebuild and to feed and do all of those things, thinking that we're going to make a big difference in someone else's life, and that's true. But that experience settles on us and renews us on this journey together. Some of you have been intentional with your financial gifts. As part of the privilege, presence, gifts, witness, and service. And my question on that is, during the summer months, we're still doing mission and ministry. We're still doing service. We're doing all kinds of things. The church doesn't close during May, June, July, and August. We are open, and we are loving, and we are gifting the community through ways of feeding and emergency assistance. And if we listen quietly, we hear the air condition running behind us. Praise God, the air condition, right? The lights are on. The air is running. All of these are intentional ways for us to further the kingdom of God. Yes, we could do this in the heat. We could do this in the dark. Don't have to anymore. We have the technology. We have the ability. Will our financial giving be intentional? Will our prayers, will our presence, will our gifts, will our witness, and will our service as we get on the path of discipleship, finding ways to grow spiritually, to recognize that our sin life is way behind us and our new life is right here with us today and beyond. So years after I was baptized, I was an adult doing adult vocational work, working at an ad agency, and I began to get tapped by my heart, by the Spirit, to grow in my own spiritual faith. And in Charleston, Missouri, way down in the boot hill, by the way, that's where Scotland is preaching these days. Out of retirement, it is the pulpit. I preached there many years ago. But the main reason that I preached there is I felt the urgency to go to a little class that was called Intentional Faith Development, intentionally being intentional about my journey. And I believe that's when God really said in my heart to hear the call. And maybe you're finding yourself in that place. Maybe you're wondering what it is, what, what is the next that I can do. Maybe you're saying, I've got a ministry idea and I would love to do it. My policy is to step out of your way. And if it's ordained by God, let it be done. You don't want to get in the way of individuals wanting to do ministry that's going to transform lives for Jesus Christ. Amen. But you might remember way back, some of you, a bishop by the name of Robert Stacey. You guys remember that name? Robert Stacey wrote a book. He wrote a book that was called Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. We have to all over the church, by the way. I know that this church read them way back in 2007. When we come on the pathway to make change. And sometimes we get on the pathway and we celebrate that and we do great things. Like the time I was baptized and said, God has changed me and I continued to be a teenager and went to college. Sometimes we get on the pathway and we step off the pathway. But the beautiful thing about the discipleship that we have in Jesus Christ with our sins behind us is God gently shows us ways to get back on the path. And so right now, your church staff is reading this chapter in this book called Risk Taking Mission and Service. And I personally am rereading the chapter called Intentional Faith Development. I'm making my leadership and my staff read this fun book called Forming Disciples Through Worship. 
I have several copies of these in my office if you would like to look at that. And the whole purpose of this, friends, is that we can be intentional by developing a discipleship pathway for all of us here today and all of us who are still to come. What does that look like for us to be intentional? For us to be hopeful about our future? It is my prayer that we journey together, and we journey together well, learning to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ already on the path. Will you stay on the journey with us? And will you seek deep within your own spirit what God is calling you to do now? We give all the glory to God who has redeemed us, set us free from our sin, and has given us new life that we truly may be made new, alive in Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
sing together number 310 and our United Methodist Hymnal, He Lives. Let's sing. <laughs> Sing our 